The Golden Age of Air Travel and the Great Douglas Airliners as they enter the Jet Age. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. Today, we're going to look at part three in our series on Douglas Airliners, the Douglas Jets. Parts one and two uh, dealt with the prop airliners, DC-1 through DC-7. I'll put links to those programs in the comments below. Uh, but part three today is going to talk about the DC-8, the DC-9, and the DC-10 jetliners. Our story begins in 1953 when the first studies for the DC-8 uh, came about in Santa Monica, California. And by 1954, Douglas had uh, the DC-8 jetliner configuration that you see here uh, on the drawing boards and in the planning stages. The problem was that Boeing already had an airplane in the air. In July of 1954, the uh, Model 367-80 that you see here uh, first took flight. And this was the uh, one-of-a-kind prototype uh, that was developed to become an Air Force uh, jet tanker for the Strategic Air Command's new jet bombers. Uh, so the airplane was funded uh, partially with Air Force uh, funding, and uh, it gave Boeing a, a leg up on Douglas with a year uh, head start. And Douglas wound up having to do the DC-8 on its own. Undaunted, Mr. Douglas forged ahead with the DC-8 uh, and committed the company's resources to developing the, uh, the first jet built by the company in Santa Monica, California. Uh, the airliner production had been centered here in Santa Monica, starting with the DC-3 and all the way up to the DC-7. Uh, but the problem was that Santa Monica's runway was 5,000 feet long by 150 feet wide, and that was not sufficient for the new jet. So the company relocated to their Air Force <coughs> plant in Long Beach, California, which had a 10,000 foot runway uh, by uh, 200 feet wide. And this plant was first created in 1941 uh, to build B-17s under license during World War II, and then became the uh, large Air Force Transport Production Center for the uh, C-124 Glowmaster and 133 Cargo Master. But in 1957, the uh, jet operations began, and the key to that was the construction of uh, buildings 80 and 84 on the east side of Lakewood Boulevard that you see here, and this became the uh, final assembly uh, buildings for uh, the new jets. What you see in the lower left is the foundation of the paint shop that was built specifically for those new airplanes as well. Here we see DC-8 Ship 1 taking shape in building 84 in 1957. And this is the wing assembly. Uh, this uh, structure featured the very beginnings of robotic construction in the sense that the uh, holes were drilled uh, mechanically and uh, structure was spaced uh, in, a, in a way that was different from the manual uh, systems for the DC-6 and 7 uh, that preceded it. And on April 9th, 1958, the first DC-8 jetliner rolled out. It was a very proud day in company history. And this photo was taken from the company's Bell 47 helicopter. This was used as a photo ship to take all the ramp shots of the factory that you've seen in uh, many of the books and magazines of that era. Uh, the rollout was kind of special because in the left seat in the cockpit was Mr. Donald W. Douglas. In the right seat was uh, Don Jr., who had just taken over as president of the company. But I want to call your attention to these photographers that you see here at lower right. The gentleman in the middle has a unique flash attachment to his camera, and they're walking over to the cockpit uh, to take a picture of Mr. Douglas as you see the ground crew moving the stairs into position. And... Uh, the flight attendants of uh, 17 airlines that ordered the airplane uh, were gonna be uh, photographed on, the, on those stairs. But here we are looking up at Mr. Douglas. You see the flash attachment at the very bottom of the photo. And up at the top is the Bell 47 that took the photos that you saw just previous to this one. Pretty cool. The DC-8 was a very elegant looking airplane. It sat high on its landing gear. It was 150 feet long, uh, wingspan was 142 feet, and it weighed, uh, the initial models weighed 275,000 pounds at takeoff. Quite, a, quite an increase over the prop uh, Douglas airliners that you see there in the background. And let's compare the uh, cockpits. This is a DC-7, 
uh, with the radio rack on the left. And uh, notice in particular the uh, size of the windshield and compare that to the uh, much better visibility that you have here in the DC-8. Notice also the oxygen masks for the pilot and co-pilot and flight engineer, which is out of sight in this photo. But uh, that was mandatory because the airplane flew uh, in the 35 to 39,000 foot uh, regime. And so that was required uh, for emergencies. And on May 30th, 1958, DC-8 ship one took to the skies. Now, the airplane in its initial form carried 125 passengers and uh, it was flight tested at Edwards Air Force Base. And this opened a whole new era in the history of the company as Douglas entered the jet age. Here we see the DC-8 uh, returning from a test flight at Long Beach and you see the Air Force transports up there at the top of the photo. And the first delivery was to United Airlines and uh, here's uh, United CEO Pat Patterson at the microphone with Mr. Douglas seated uh, there on the right. They were uh, very good friends. And United uh, launched DC-8 service along with Delta in 1959. And what you see here is a, uh, it's, it was originally called the DC-8 Series 10. It was modified to the 21. And so the first iteration of the DC-8 was powered by uh, four Pratt & Whitney JT-3C turbojets. That was the civilian version of the J-57 that powered airplanes like the F-100. Uh, but the smoke that you see here um, it, was a, it was something of that era. We wouldn't see something like this today. This wouldn't be acceptable in terms of pollution and just the sight of it. But uh, in 1958, this was the beginning of the jet age and people accepted this. Uh, the smoke was produced, that's, that's not exhaust uh, per se, that's the result of uh, water and alcohol being injected into the uh, combustion chambers of the engines to boost uh, takeoff thrust. Um, and that was an asset, except that the airplane had to carry 5,000 pounds of water uh, which was used only one time on takeoff and that affected the payload, obviously. But um, later versions had uh, engines that did not produce this, uh, this kind of smoke. Uh, Pan Am operated the Series 30. This was the first intercontinental version of the DC-8. And it's interesting to note that Juan Tripp, president of Pan American, ordered more DC-8s initially than he did Boeing 707s. And that was because the uh, DC-830 that you see here, which was powered by JT-4A turbojets, uh, the military, uh, I'm sorry, the civilian uh, version of the J-75, uh, produced 16,000 pounds of thrust, which was 4,000 more than the Series uh, 21. And uh, again, this airplane had close to 4,000 mile range where the initial 707-120 series uh, had uh, closer to 33, maybe 3,500 mile range. But that changed with the 707 Intercontinental. Early operators were Eastern Airlines, as I mentioned, Delta, United. United had a very unique passenger loading system. And I should mention that in 1958 and 59, airports had not been modified. The terminals uh, had not been modified to uh, have jetways uh, for the jet age, which came later. And so United had a motorized self-propelled uh, boarding stair. And also back in those days, they had separate doors and separate entrances and separate boarding for first class and coach passengers. On August 21st, 1961, this DC-8 that you see here, a Canadian Pacific uh, DC-8 Series 40, powered by Rolls-Royce uh, Conway uh, engines, uh, made history by becoming the first jet airliner to achieve supersonic speed. Now, yes, this was in a dive, but the airplane uh, flew at Mach 1.012 at 41,000 feet. And the chase plane that you see there was a specially calibrated, specially instrumented F-104 flown by none other than the first man to go supersonic, uh, Charles E. Chuck Yeager. Uh, the next step in the DC-8 evolution was the fan jet. This is a ducted fan engine on a uh, test airplane, but this became the DC-8 uh, Series 50. You see there the famous Douglas sign. Uh, so here we have a DC-8, actually Series 55 in uh, Trans-Carib markings. And this is being photographed uh, from the famed uh, North American B-25 flown by uh, Paul Mance. Uh, he did uh, movie work and Cinerama, uh, a lot of famous uh, filming from this uh, iconic airplane. But Douglas employed it for air-to-air -air shots, for ads and, 
and promo. Next step was the uh, 60 series. This is a lengthened uh, fuselage, uh, went from 150 feet up to 187 feet. And this became the 60 series. The 61 was the uh, wing and engine of the 55 uh, uh, Pratt Fanjet with uh, the longer fuselage, which held 250 people. And this was really a breakthrough. This is 1967. Now, if you take the fuselage of a 61, and you add a lengthened wing and uh, modified engines and pylons, you get the 63, which was used as a freighter and also a passenger airplane. And you see there, this was called the jumbo jet, but 250 passengers in 1967, that was three years before the 747. So it was a revolutionary airplane in its own right. Now take the advanced wing and engines of the 63, uh, which you see here, these were called uh, uh, flow through nacelles and cut back pylons, and they reduce drag significantly. But uh, take those structures and uh, shorten the fuselage again back to uh, 100 and, uh, 155 feet, and you get the Series 62. What this was, was a long range airplane. This was really the beginning of long range travel. This could go from New York to Honolulu, Hawaii nonstop. And uh, this was a, a really big step in the uh, development of intercontinental travel. The 63 freighter was uh, just a very uh, popular airplane and uh, had tremendous longevity. It was uh, first flown, as I mentioned, in 1967, and it flew uh, well into the 2000s with uh, UPS and a number of other carriers that uh, used this airplane to, to best advantage. Um, here we see it over Long Beach. And the airplane was re-engined uh, in the 70 series. These are CFM 56. Uh, engines with uh, 25,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, this is a DC-8, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 73 uh, in Flying Tiger's markings uh, undergoing stall testing. Pretty dramatic recovery angle there, but an interesting photo I thought I'd included in this uh, program. And an airplane flying today is a 70 series uh, airplane with NASA flown as an airborne laboratory. It's a DC-8-72. And this is uh, flying uh, throughout the world uh, doing high altitude atmospheric research and all sorts of other uh, scientific tests, but a tribute to the longevity of the great DC-8. Next in the family was the DC-9. This is the baby Douglas jet, and uh, it began as a <clears throat> marketing study for Douglas to uh, sell and, and uh, support the Sud Caravelle, a French airplane um, in the United States. United Airlines was already flying the Caravelle in 1960, and as I said, Douglas was uh, determining whether they wanted to market the airplane and possibly build it in Long Beach as well. Uh, but what resulted from that, the airplane was just too small and it had uh, performance limitations. And so Douglas uh, designed the DC-9, uh, which was a hundred uh, seat airplane uh, with about a 1200 mile range. Uh, it was 105 feet long with a 90 foot wingspan. And it held, uh, as I said, hundred passengers for short to medium range uh, routes in the 1200 to 1500 mile range. Uh, and so this brought jet travel to smaller cities uh, throughout the United States and all over the world. Uh, it was a T-tail rear engine airplane. The advantages uh, were twofold. The rear engines uh, put the, the noise behind the airplane, which resulted in a much quieter cabin. Uh, and the T-tail uh, allowed uh, a, a clean wing. Um, you see here the uh, Efficiency of the wing was, was increased significantly uh, by not having the engine pylons uh, hanging from it. And notice also the uh, forward uh, air stair, which was integral, it folded into the uh, lower part of the door. And so uh, combined with an APU, auxiliary power unit, uh, the airplane was self-sufficient. It could land at a small airport, didn't need uh, boarding stairs or jetways to, to uh, <clears throat> board the passengers. And the airplanes could be started without a huffer cart uh, on their own from the uh, APU power. Delta Airlines was the launch customer. Here you see it in a quasi Delta marking uh, uh, during a promo tour. And this is an interesting photo. This is actually the first airplane. This is ship one, but painted on the left side only with a water soluble uh, paint job uh, showing Eastern. And this was done for a tour of Eastern executives that were uh, coming around the corner <laughs> on the East ramp at Long Beach there. 
And uh, lo and behold, they saw this airplane and uh, were quite inspired. Eastern wound up ordering quite a few DC-9s, uh, uh, although the, uh, the later uh, Series 30. Uh, some of the early operators were TWA. And uh, the Series 30 was a stretched lengthened DC-9 with uh, uh, about 130 passenger capacity. Uh, for you uh, spotters, the easiest way to uh, tell a DC-930 from the 10 is the two overwing emergency exits. That's kind of the giveaway, plus it looks slightly longer. Uh, this is the Northeast Yellow Bird, a beautiful uh, color scheme. And here's the production line. The uh, Series 10s and the Series 30s came down the same production line. You see a, a Series 10 uh, uh, TWA airplane on the right and the Delta Series 30 and all the other airplanes in the row. Uh, but this is building 80 at Long Beach. And uh, DC-9s were used in the military. They were used by the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps as uh, military transports, uh, as well as the uh, 89th uh, Special Airlift Wing at uh, Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, which supported the uh, presidential uh, flights. Uh, the DC-9, the VC-9 uh, that you see here uh, was a VIP airplane used as Air Force Two. And perhaps the most famous DC-9 was the, uh, what they call the bunny jet. This was the private airplane for Hugh Hefner of Playboy magazine. The DC-9 was further stretched into the series 40 and the 50 that you see here at the upper left. A uh, total of 976 DC-9s were built uh, from 1965 to 1981. And uh, this is a perfect uh, image for the segue to our next airplane, which is the DC-10. This uh, painting by George Akimoto uh, represented the company products uh, in the uh, early 1970s. The DC-10 began uh, as a twin engine airplane. This was a requirement for American Airlines to have a 250 seat aircraft that could operate out of New York's LaGuardia Airport and fly to Chicago. Uh, United would use the airplane from the West Coast to Denver. Uh, and uh, the idea was to have a wide body, high capacity airplane uh, that could operate out of existing airports. Uh, but they suddenly realized that uh, if they added a third engine, uh, the airplane would have transcontinental range and they stretched the fuselage to carry 270 passengers. And this became the final configuration for the DC-10. The airplane was 182 feet long with 155 foot wingspan. Uh, weight at takeoff on the initial models was 450,000 pounds. And it had a 3,500 mile range in the domestic version and we'll see in a bit here the uh, Intercontinental Series 30 with a 5,200 mile range. But the whole secret to the DC-10 was what they call the twin aisle configuration. So here we have a mock-up of first class and notice the bright colors and everybody's smiling and you have the executive in the front row there working on that big deal. And uh, this was first class in the new uh, wide body era of jet transportation. And compare that to the uh, mock-up for coach I mean, you look at the guy at the left there and he's like, are we there yet? Uh, and notice also, uh, this looks quite spacious, but uh, look carefully, you've got a mirror at the rear bulkhead and that uh, doubles the size. So that fellow walking uh, forward in the uh, left aisle is also walking backward in the, in the mirror. But it was a neat uh, trick to, to make it look more, more spacious than it was. On uh, July 23rd, 1970, the uh, rollout ceremony for the first DC-10 was held at Long Beach. And this is quite a historic photograph. In the front row from left, you have uh, James McDonnell, uh, then Vice President Spiro Agnew, then Governor of California, Ronald Reagan, and on the right, uh, Mr. Douglas. And this was a, a poignant moment for him. The, the company had been merged with McDonnell in 1967. And this was the first airliner built under the new regime. And I'll bet you can't tell where the Secret Service guys are in this photo. They're <laughs> right there. Uh, construction of the DC-10 represented uh, uh, some new challenges and the uh, barrel sections of the fuselage were delivered uh, from their uh, uh, subassembly plants there in uh, San Diego. They were built by Convair. And those barrel sections were flown to Long Beach in the Super Guppy. And uh, the nose would swing open. What you see here is actually a, a section of the Saturn uh, rocket in the Apollo program, but it was the same diameter uh, roughly as the DC-10 fuselage. So this is how the uh, components were 
brought to Long Beach. And the uh, Building 84, which uh, rolled out the DC-8 intact, uh, the DC-10s were too large to uh, come out of the building with their vertical stabilizers on. So the vertical stabilizers were added by crane on the ramp uh, in front of Building 84, which you see here. And that Douglas jet sign has been modified to DC jets. But uh, the DC-10, uh, as I said, held 270 passengers was powered by uh, General Electric CF6-6 turbofans, which produced uh, 40,000 pounds of thrust on the domestic version. Early operators were Continental, United, American, uh, National that you see here. And this was the glory days. This is a photo taken in 1972 from that uh, same Douglas helicopter. And what you see on the ramp uh, now are the Series 30 intercontinental versions. These were powered by uh, General Electric CF6-50 turbofans that produced 50,000 pounds of thrust. And uh, they had true intercontinental range. But you see here all the uh, foreign operators, the intercontinental airlines. And uh, an evolution of the DC-10 was the KC-10 tanker, which uh, won a competition against the 747 to become the Air, Force, uh, Air Force's newest tanker in the early 1980s. And here we see uh, the KC-10 landing at Long Beach. This was uh, a DC-1030 airframe fitted with a refueling boom and a uh, hose and drogue uh, system as well for Navy airplanes and international airplanes. Uh, this is what we call the Shamu color scheme, the dark gray and white, uh, and named after the killer whale for obvious reasons. But a very successful airplane, 60 KC-10s were built and they're still flying all over the world to this day. By the early 1980s, uh, the next steps were being studied for stretching the DC-10 into what eventually became the MD-11. And the names of the airplanes were changed from DC to MD for McDonnell Douglas. But we're gonna cover that uh, era in a separate program uh, to be posted uh, in the future. So there you have it, a look at Douglas in the jet age. We hope you've enjoyed the program and uh, thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. As always, special thanks to uh, the good folks who uh, gave us the imagery for this program and made these uh, uh, presentations possible. Uh, Jeff Thomas of AirlineRatings.com in uh, Perth, Australia, the Museum of Flying and the original Douglas Library and Archive. Again, hope you enjoyed the program and until next time, take care. <laughs>